So um, I guess uh, typically what I do is just ask people to just uh, maybe talk a little bit about, obviously, you know, being a guitarist for Billy Ray Cyrus. Everybody wants to know how you got that gig and what that what that is like. But maybe just start a little bit about you personally. Um, how'd you get started playing guitar? Kind of take us through kind of, a, you know, the high points journey of, of your, uh, your, ex- your experience all the way up to uh, being a lead guitarist for Billy Ray. <clears throat> I... Uh... Started playing when I was a teenager because all my friends played and I thought it was pretty neat. So then I got into it and then I wasn't really serious into it. And then I was in this metal band with my friends, but I sucked really bad. (laughs) So I remember I was eating dinner with my mom one night and the phone rang and Josh, the lead guitarist, he was asking for me, and then she's like, well, he's eating. And it's like, well, tell him he got the pink slip. And my mom's like, I think you just got fired from your band. <laughs> like, oh, man. So it, 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 like, it drove me. To, I was like, well, I'll show them. And I started taking lessons. And, um, you know, I was like into it. But what happened was the bug hit me. And this is going to sound so cliche. But, like, the moment when I realized, like, Okay, this is this is the bug hit me. I was with a girlfriend. I was in high school, and we went to see her friend's boyfriend's band play. And we all got in a van, and we went. And I'm driving back from the gig. I was like sleeping in the back of the van, and this music came on. I was like, "What is this?" And it was Ingve Ingve Malmsteen, uh-huh. and I think it was like Black Star and Far Beyond the Sun. I was like, "This is." the coolest thing i've ever heard so i got into that and then i got really into like aldi miola and joe pass those were like my three dudes i was like obsessed and like the bug hit me and i just started taking lessons learning about theory and everything and it was like from that i was 17 that was at 17 and that's when i really started taking it serious and then i went to community college and then i ended up going to unf north florida I got a degree in jazz studies uh, and I wanted to be a jazz guitarist. That was like my whole thing. I was obsessed with it. But then I started actually working and making money. I was in a, for a couple of years, I was in a black gospel group and I played in black churches and that was like game changing too. That was the coolest to this day, probably the (laughs) coolest musical experience I've ever been fortunate enough to be a part of. Mm-hmm. And uh, playing with those guys still to this day, I I don't know if I've met anyone that's as good as those guys. They mm-hmm. were free. And uh, you know, I started playing clubs and bars, and then I I kind of like the jazz thing went to the wayside, and I moved back to South Florida and started playing in bar bands with my friends. And I was teaching guitar lessons, and I haven't played jazz since 2007 when I graduated. So, yeah, that's out the window. And then, you know, I, I was teaching, and one of my students brought in a Brad Paisley record. Now, I wasn't hip to country. I was a jazz rock guy, you know, so she brought that in, and she wanted to learn some Brad Paisley stuff. So I started learning it, and I was like, wow, this is incredible. So I started getting into that that type of guitar playing, and then by default, I joined a couple country bands in South Florida and started getting really into that stuff. And then the whole Nashville thing was a big dream of mine, but I never thought I was good enough, so I never, like, it was like a dream, but that's about it. It was too far out of reach. Mm-hmm. And I was playing in this country band, and this artist, Brett Eldridge, came through on his first single before he blew up on a radio tour and I, he sat in with us and I was chatting with the guitar player. I was like, Hey man, I, you're living my dream. How do I do this? He's like, you got to move. You got to solve the geographical thing and mm-hmm. get out. I'm like, well, cause that's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. And this night that we were playing, it was hosted by a radio station and every week we would play it. And the, the, the DJ guy was like, when are you moving to Nashville? And I was like, I'm not, I'm not good enough. Stop asking. So we played with Brett Eldridge. He sat in and 
he called me the next day, the the radio guy. He's like, hey, man, what if I can get you an audition? I was like, what? He's like, yeah, the, the manager and Brett liked you, so they want to try you out. So I was like, oh, my God, this is crazy. So I drove out to Tampa. It was like four hours away. And I was a nervous wreck because to me, like a Nashville touring guitar player, session guitar player, anything Nashville was like the peak of the mountain. I was like, these are my heroes. So whenever we would open up for Nashville bands, I was in awe. I was like, wow, it's like the coolest thing. <clears throat> so I went there. I was a nervous wreck. And I don't think I said one word the whole time I was there. We, we, were, we were all huddled in a hotel room and I played through the songs with them. And then we went to sound check and I was just amazed. I was like, this is unreal. So then I didn't hear back from him and I called the manager. I was like, dude, what's up? Um, it's like, well, dude, we didn't get a feel for you because you literally didn't talk, you know? So <laughs> he, was, he was like, if you were in Nashville, we would have gave you a shot, threw you on the bus, see how you messed with the guys, but mm -hmm. you know, we're moving quick and you're in Florida. So I was like, well, what advice do you have? And he said, well, move to Nashville and get some stage time because we could tell you were really nervous. So mm -hmm. I was like, okay, okay, that's it. So I was thinking about my buddy. In Florida, I was like, dude, you got to do it. You just, now's the time. And, geez, I was 27. It was right before April 2011, right before my 28th birthday. And I was like, okay, it's now or never. So, you know, because I, I got a late start, you know, 28. But um, I just literally quit all my bands and teaching and just threw clothes and some guitars into uh, my my car, and I just drove up to Nashville. And I had one friend, and I, I, I had a room, but it fell through on the trip up. I called the guy. He's like, oh, yeah, it got taken. I was like, Jesus, well, now I got nowhere to stay. <laughs> so I stayed at my buddy Lee's house. He was gracious enough to let me crash in his basement for two weeks till I found a place. Um. But actually, the first night I came to Nashville, I met him out. He was out at some bars, and as luck would have it, there was a drummer there, and he introduced us, and he was like, hey, we're looking for a guitar player, and it was like this bar gig thing. But that was my mm -hmm. first gig in Nashville, so I got a gig the first night, which was a trip. Mm -hmm. And then I moved into this, this basement at this guy's house for really cheap and just... just took every gig that came my way and just was practicing like crazy. And, you know, it was, it was a very slow, slow grind. And then it got really slow during the winter and I wanted to move home. Cause it was like, man, this is, I didn't know anyone. No one was calling me. It was cause I was from Florida. It's so funny. You know, when you, when you move, I hate to use the term like big fish, small pond. Cause I'm not a big fish, but like I was busy. I was working. I was right. working five, six gigs a week, making money, teaching to nothing. It's like a big shock. You're like, oh, damn right. it. So I stuck it out. My friend was like, you got to stick it out, man. And I'm so glad I did. And then the first gig, the first big gig I got, because I was playing on Broadway and doing random one-offs with bands. Now, Broadway, for anybody that hasn't been in Nashville, describe Broadway. Well, Broadway, Lower Broadway is three or four blocks and Second Avenue of just bars. And when, when I moved to Nashville, it's funny because it was all single level. And you could park on the street right in front of the bar. And now it is insane. Every bar has like three levels with a rooftop. And they're jamming hundreds. on every level. Every <laughs> level. There's, it's chaos down there. <laughs> and uh, when I moved there, it wasn't. The Nashville hadn't exploded yet in 2011. It was still pretty honky tonk. And I was doing that, and then my buddy called me for Shadaisy, uh, the the female vocal group. And I went out and did a fly day with Shadaisy, and then I picked up a gig, and I started touring for like a year with uh, this girl Morgan Fraser, and that was really awesome because it was all these like big opening slots actually the audition for that gig and this was crazy because 
the audition was the gig and the gig was opening up for Dirks Bentley in front of like 10,000 people. So I was like, Oh my mm-hmm. God. And I had never played with the band. So for all you people listening, that that's how Nashville works. Literally the first note I played with that band was in front of 10,000 people. Wow. And, uh, uh, I, I got the gig luckily. And but that, so, that's so it sounds like let me let me uh, let me pause you here. So it's like you know, kind of like I think that's a that's an important kind of point to kind of unpack a little bit, like how Nashville works. Because it sounds like okay, number one, you realize you got to move to Nashville if you, if you if you have any chance of kind of connecting because it's it's a networking thing. It's not about how good you are. It's about who you're exposed to, who you know, big, references. Big yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the big thing, you got to be able to play. That's like a given because there's a bar here. But there's a thousand. You could throw out a rock out of the window and hit, hit yeah. an incredible so, guitar player. In so that's, that's where the other two aspects come in. Your network and how good your hang is. If you're an ass, there's a lot of good players in this town that are really hard to be around. God bless them, but you know. People just don't want to work with them. They're amazing, but it's, and then, I mean, there's guys that I'll call that aren't the best. They're good enough, but I love Mm -hmm. being around them. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I'll call those guys always, you know, it's always about that, like the personality and, I think every, that's a kind of default it's chemistry. Stuff. It's about, right. I mean, it's about chemistry and just, you know, being able to kind of sync with somebody. It's like, it, that's more important than, okay, this person is the best or at a certain yeah. level, because it's, it's more important to have that kind of like sync synchronicity and, and that kind of chemistry. Would you say? Actually, absolutely. And it's, it's mm-hmm. on two fronts on the personality front. And then Nashville is a funny place where you have to be, able to adjust to any musical situation so you know like i said like i've never met these people on this gig except the bass player he's the one who got me the gig but i didn't know any of the other players so you have to be able to play with any musician that's the other thing you have to be like be able to fit in any musical situation with players you've never met and that's Mm. how session work is you know you walk in you might never meet the people okay let's make a record but that's kind of the gig, you know, you have to meld into and just be a chameleon and fit the musical situation. So, yeah, so that, that, that's a really important thing on personality and playability, but, and you don't have to be the world's greatest player to, you know, I always like to say, like, I, I I just want to be the best guy at being invisible. Like you don't hear me, you know, but I'm there. And right. you know, because you want to pack the stadiums to see Chris Condon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're not you're not going to a gig to see me. You're going, you know. So, as a side guy or a session guy, you know, it, it's always about just kind of blending in, and you're not the you're not the spotlight. And I've always loved that. I've always loved the thing in a session, like the part that you mute that you don't know is there, but when you mute it, you miss it. You know that mm-hmm. type of stuff. And that's yeah. how it is with live stuff. You know, you got to just meld into the thing with your tones and your pocket. Just so that, like, because <laughs> it's a funny thing. How I know a drummer or bass player is great is if you ask me, were they good? And I say, I don't know. Because I didn't notice them. They're invisible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's how I know you're a great drummer or bass player. Because I didn't hear you. Mm-hmm. You didn't stick yeah. out. And that's yeah. that's the role. So yeah, that's cool. Yeah, but so, so then you know I did that gig for a while. Then I toured with Drake White and uh, Logan Mize and Granger Smith and a bunch of other people. And then uh, I got the Billy gig, which was a fluke. <laughs> like to, to talk about that, yeah. Okay, so, it sounds like this led to that, led to this, led to that, led to <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so um. <laughs> How did it all take shape? So, you know, doing the gigging thing, and then 2014, I bought a house, <clears throat> and then 2015, I um, wanted to start building out like a studio kind of thing. So, 
the first record I ever recorded was my dear friend uh, Derek Jones. I've done a couple records for him, but uh, the first thing I did for him, I believe it was the Prey Prey record. That was me learning Pro Tools. Like I had never used Pro Tools. I didn't know anything about recording. And it was like a trial by fire. So I recorded this record for him. And somehow he knew Billy's brother. And and he's like a country guy. And there's a lot of like Waylon Jennings type phaser guitar. So Billy somehow got the CD. And he was like, who played guitar on this? And he reached out to me. And he's like, hey, I'd like to meet you. Let's jam. I was like, whoa, that's pretty heavy. Which was really flattering because I've never gotten a gig. You know, in Nashville, it's usually like auditions and all this silly stuff. But for somebody, it's a very cattle call. It's like doesn't mean anything. Mm-hmm. But for somebody to actually be like, yo, I like what you did. You know, it was, it was like kind of a shock to me because that's never happened. So mm-hmm. I went over there. We hit it off. And he's like, hey, man, do you want to like put together a band and run the show and do the thing and go on tour? I was like, oh, damn, OK. Let me think about it. <laughs> yeah. I'll get back to you, Billy. <laughs> so I put together a band. <laughs> and to this day, we've only had one rehearsal with Billy the whole time. Oh, really? I put together a slamming band. And he came in and we ran down the set and he's like, damn, I've never had a band. This is the best band I've had. And I was a shock because, you know, we were all flattered. Like he was really happy. And to the day we have not rehearsed. Our rehearsals are like sound check. Like, hey, let's do this new song. And he'll throw a song in the mix. But, you know, but that's also the thing with Nashville. You just like, like I was saying, you got to show up and just that's it. You got to deliver. So... I was grateful that all my friends pulled through and impressed him. And, you know, I've been with him since then. And then, uh, yeah, the, the old town road thing, that was a trip. But talk, you talk know? about, talk about that. Talk about tour, like talk about anything kind of like high points, low points with, well, with um, pre-COVID. okay. It was funny when I first got the gig, it was, you know, your typical, older country crowd and then old town road came out and management called me and they said hey billy just put this song out we think it's gonna be kind of big and within like days this thing went you know it's the biggest song in history it broke every record it was like insane and then the crowds got way younger and we're like whoa we're cool now (laughs) there's three generations of billy you got your achy breaky heart <laughs> your 90s billy fans and then you got your hannah montana fans and then you got your old town road fans. so you'd have this like age gap in the crowd and it was insane to see and that he's like you know 60 and he's got the it's it's ultimately dewey cox it's like the end of Dewey Cox when he does that collaboration with the rapper and he re does himself, you know, like it's the same thing. It's awesome. Like the, the way that Billy can stay relevant always blows my mind. Like that guy mm-hmm. is, he's a gem, man. That guy's unreal. How he could just keep it going. Uh, I don't know anyone else who could <laughs> say that, you know, it's, yeah. it's like, sounds like, I mean, he's a true artist, right? I mean, he's, yeah. He's, and just to have okay. that, that type of career, I, 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 I got to hand it to him. It's mm-hmm. incredible. But mm-hmm. that, that's that been really fun. And uh, it's slowed down a lot. You know, COVID, well, what's crazy about COVID is that we had, right before COVID hit, he had come off of winning like three Grammys for Old Town Road. So we were booked on like Lollapalooza, uh, Stagecoach, like the biggest it was going to be like his biggest year ever. And then COVID hits and mm-hmm. just level the field. And that really put a stop on it. Um, so who knows what happened if that didn't, you know, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, so it's, it's been progressively slowing down, but um, 
you know, so talk uh, about pre pre COVID. Sort of like what I mean. We're, did, have you toured internationally? You know, as a, as a band, yeah, we, like went, what, we, you know. we went to Australia and Canada. That's the only thing that's like out of the U.S. Yeah. Um, and then, like, how how big of like what's what what would you say like the largest crowds you've played played? The largest to? crowd we played for was the twenty nineteen or yeah twenty nineteen uh, CMA awards at the uh, Nissan Stadium, and I think that was seventy or eighty thousand sold out, which no, was like no. the biggest rush because we get on stage, it's like every seat's filled, and I'm like, whoa. <laughs> So talk that, about that, that. Talk about the feeling. Talk about like the the nerves or the you know just like the energy. You know, I I don't you know I equate this gig or to this job of it's a job. You know you you show up and you do it. So the stage fright thing doesn't really come into play. That night I was shitting my pants. I was like, <laughs> this is this is insane. So. That that it was that's one of the biggest rushes, you know, when mm. we got to do that. Um, it was over before it started. It started the dream, right? Yeah, you know, to be to be, you know, oh, it's, to it's do nice. that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah like you, it's gone, it's done. You know, you're like it goes by so fast. Yeah, but yeah. that that was uh, in, incredible. And then, you know, we've done um, we did the CCMAs. That was like a live. Uh, award show so and then you know the opry and then good morning america and all, all that fun stuff so we've done like big tv things uh so it's cool you know, that's it, fun all right so talk a little bit about okay obviously i mean COVID's hit every musician you know everywhere um so like just talk a little bit about kind of like how you've had to pivot um career-wise during during that during that time and kind of like where you're at now yeah so when 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 covid hit i just doubled down on production work you know and just it was crazy because i don't know if it was like stimulus money or but they really had money to record and it just it was it was rolling man it was it was mm -hmm. a good time to, to do that and uh it's kind of funny because it actually burned me out um Cause I was doing so much turnover that it kind of got me out of the production thing. And now I'm just focusing on session playing. I do produce mm -hmm. something in there, but the, the focus is definitely just playing sessions at other studios. Yeah. They have a, uh, uh, an enviable, an enviable home studio. If we, if you had your phone, I'd have you walk us around, but, uh, I've got some, I think we have some photos here. We'll, we'll, we'll put on screen, but, uh, yeah, to, uh, to talk a little bit about your home home studio, and uh, you were featured well, on some other. Yeah, 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 yeah. The Andrew Masters studio uh, tour. Mm -hmm. uh, that was super cool. He's great. Um, it, it it's my house, and I turned it all into a studio. So it's been a a work in progress. It started just in the basement. Everything mm -hmm. was in there, and then I was really battling with drums with having clients. Cause like the more, the more I built, you know, I don't, I didn't know what I was doing. I still don't know what I'm doing, but yeah. learning by doing, I, I learned the biggest thing I learned was isolation is your best friend. Like once I started isolating singers in other rooms and guitars in other mm -hmm. rooms and drums in other rooms, you just, the tone is so much better because you're actually hearing it through the speakers and you could hear phase. You could isolate things. You could actually hear what the compressor's doing as opposed to sitting in a room and you got to record it and then tweak it and it just takes so long. So mm -hmm. I could EQ a Tom in real time while he's hitting it. And it, it just makes for a way better product, but it started in the basement. And then here I'm actually in my living room. I turned this all into a, this is the control room, uh, but you could see it online. And then I, uh, turn the back room into a vocal room and the other room into an acoustic room. So it, I, I could do seven people at once here. Hmm. So downstairs is drums and I could have three musicians and then one in the, this room and then two back there. So, so tell me now how, 
How does being a, so uh, would you call yourself a producer? Is is that like one of the hats that you wear among the many yeah. hats? Or? Yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely. Talk a little bit about how that makes you a better musician to understand. Oh, man, the man, man, the man. That's a great question. Because I think it goes hand in hand. Every great session player is by default like a producer because you have to like have an understanding of how the song works. It's It's never... A singular thing it's never about your guitar or the bass so and not to say that i'm great at anything but i did learn a lot from producing it really helped my session playing because you're really just constantly thinking full spectrum and like like i said being invisible man guitar doesn't matter nothing matters like it's just you know melding in it's not your show yeah so combined effort thing. Yeah. yeah and just how to layer yeah. and how to like what what's the right part for the song what's the right tone mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that all comes into play and that really prepared me for doing sessions so now i full-time you know so lucky but now it's full-time sessions so you know around five to eight nine a week at other studios wow. so it's, it's full-time i'm i'm incredibly blessed to and you understand to- you, you as a since you've had that you've on the other side of that you know kind of what they're looking for and you could just basically do your do your part be a puzzle piece that fits perfectly with with the other you know instruments or whatever is expected of you that's that's the hope you need to show off right (laughs) yeah well it's never yeah like here's the thing you never want to get asked to play less (laughs) that's the rule of thumb man i'll tell you want people two things as a guitar player. Listen up. <laughs> you want to be told to turn up and play more. <laughs> and if you do those two things, you'll keep working. Yeah. That's a, that's a great advice. That's great advice. Yeah, to turn down so, uh, and play less is, is the worst. <laughs> you, know, you might not get invited back, right? <laughs> right. That's, so that's <laughs> kind of live my life by that. Just kind of stay out of the way and do my thing. But so, uh, that's it. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was, but you have to play with authority at the same time. You have to play it like it. You've been playing it forever, so there's that. But doing it with conviction is the most important thing. But knowing your lane and blending for other aspiring guitar players that you know want to make quote make it uh, in music, you've given some great advice already. Do you have any 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 other you know tidbits of advice? One thing I, I, I would want you to maybe kind of touch on a little bit because uh, this theme has come up before is um, early on in your career you talked a little bit about self doubt, and I think that's a, uh, a kind of a a common you know thing that a lot of players have is you know struggling with I'm not good enough, and maybe you are, maybe you aren't. But like, kind of like for somebody that's at that more early stage of that career that wants to take that track, what's some advice that you would give that person? Well, the brutal advice, well, the brutal realism of it, that that feeling never goes away. (laughs) You're always going to think you suck. And I I think the best people do feel that because it's, it's, it's the love of the craft and always wanting to get better. And the goalpost always moves. So like you never get there, but starting out, advice i would say is uh i mean just say yes to everything and just immerse yourself in situations that challenge you because looking back man i remember i was on a gig in jacksonville with this guy as a crappy trio whatever bar gig he's like and he said he's like man these gigs might suck but you're gonna look back and this is preparing you for like down the road and it's so true because there's nothing like learning on a gig like you could practice in your room all day but nothing will give you the realism of a session and a gig it's it's the 10,000 hours thing like you know and, and like i said the stage fright thing goes away because you you get like comfortable enough in it from doing it so much it's like just second nature so you know, that that's my advice is say yes to everything because everything is training. It's all practice. Mm-hmm. It's practice and it's also 
I've always treated it as practice and networking because I don't go out. I don't, I'm not a hang guy. I'm an introverted weirdo and I, I never leave my house. So I always take gigs as a way to like meet people because I'll never meet anyone if I don't take gigs. So that's always been my thing of, of networking through working. And then, and then people get to hear you. So it's like, you're learning, you're making some money, you're meeting people, you're learning. It's all learning. You're just learning, learning, learning. And that's the most important thing. And even if you don't make money, just say yes, because you never know on the shittiest gigs I've had. I've met some of my best friends and best connections on the worst gigs. So, you know, you just you, you take the good with the bad, but just just always approach it as like I approached Nashville as school. I was like, because when, when I was moving here, everyone from down home, they were like, oh, you're going to fail. You'll be back in six months. I was like, that's great. Fine. If I do great. But if I learned something, then it wasn't a waste of time. And at least I tried to do it. It's better than me getting older and saying, I wish I would have. Cause that's, that's the worst. I love, right? I so, love that frame. Of mind. You know, think of it as school. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. And to this day, I've always, I said every day I wake up and it's like, what can I learn today? And that's what keeps me going is, is the craft. And that's why the, the goalpost moves because as you get better, you don't notice you're getting better. You just like, and then, then, you start achieving things and getting on bigger gigs. And then next thing you know, you're like, Oh my God, like I'm living my dream. And you don't even realize they still think you suck. I mean, every day I'm like <laughs> the worst, but <laughs> what can you do? You know, that's just, that's why we're musicians are nuts, but um, that's just part of it. Awesome. Yeah. That's, that's great. And no, I appreciate that. Um, yeah. The last question I have for you is, um, so do you have any um, personal uh, mu music, Mus musical uh, projects you're working on or other than session work you're doing have any kind of you know things that like uh thing and how can somebody find out more about you and, and follow you and, and what you're doing well you can follow me on instagram chris condon guitar my website chris condon guitar.com uh i have a project with my buddy ryan pruitt it's like a synthwave project but Man, it's been years since we put something new out. I need to start writing for that, but that that's my solo thing. It's called Atomics, A-T-O-M-I-K-S. And uh, mostly it's just session playing. Uh, there's a few artists I've been working with that uh, some new music should be coming out that I'm excited about. Um, but, you know, if you follow me on Instagram, you'll, you'll see it. Cool. I'll make sure I'll put links to, to all your stuff and hook you up. You know, Chris, thank you so much for your, for your time. And this has been a oh, great geez. interview, great information and had so much fun. And uh, thanks for being such a great uh, uh, brand ambassador for Bog Street. Jamming well, with thank, us. You for, thank you for having me and the awesome products.